From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. This is where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. The Senate passed the $1.9 trillion stimulus bill over the weekend, and it looks now like it's going to be headed for the president for signing later this week. To take us through where we are right now, we welcome now Anna Edgerton, who covers Capitol Hill for Bloomberg. So, Anna, thanks so much. The Senate got through. What happens next? So the Senate did make some changes to the bill, which means it needs to go back to the House. But that should be a pretty quick process. We expect the House to pass the bill again on Tuesday, and then it'll go straight to Biden's desk. You know, it needs to go through all of the kind of uh, ceremonial parts, but Biden should be able to sign this into law by the end of the week. So as a practical matter, does that mean that the people with the unemployment benefits will not have interruption in them? Because that was March 14 was the deadline, right? That's right. March 14th is the drop dead deadline, but of course it takes a little while for that money to be flowing again because of all the different state unemployment systems. But this should give plenty of time for that to have some kind of continuity without an actual lapse in benefits. Do they take a break now or do they go on to other legislation? They're going to move straight on to other legislation. And, you know, the next thing we're looking at is the shape of this big infrastructure package. You know, progressives said that they were not happy with some of the changes that were made in the Senate, but they're going to get another bite of the apple with the next package that comes through that should be focused a lot more on actual stimulus, you know, like getting more money into the economy via things like infrastructure and less focus on the actual pandemic. Okay, Anna, thank you very much for that report. That's Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton, who reports on Capitol Hill. President Biden looks like he's going to get that huge stimulus package that he wants. Wanted, but what will it mean for the economy and, for that matter, for investors? To find out, we welcome now Libby Cantrell. She is head of public policy for PIMCO. Libby, always great to have you with us. So what does it mean for the economy? You've got a great note out that basically says maybe we can have 60s growth without 70s inflation. Yeah, that's exactly exactly right, uh, David. Um, we are anticipating you know, real GDP growth of around 7 percent uh, in, in 2021, uh, big tailwind to growth because of this, you know, nearly $1.9 trillion package. But we don't importantly see uh, the likelihood of 1970s style inflation. And that's just because of many of the structural changes to, to the economy. So, you know, kind of that sweet spot in some ways, at least for 2021, now 2022 might be a different story, um, but high growth and, you know, relatively low, low inflation. So not everybody agrees with it. A lot of people do, but not everybody agrees with it. you got the likes of Larry Summers, at least warning about the possibility of real inflation coming down the pike, in part because there's a lot of money sitting in the sidelines, particularly at households. They've saved a lot of money, and now we're putting more money into that, and then it could all come back as we come out of the pandemic. And, in fact, I'm not sure we can produce enough goods and services to soak it up. Yeah, and I mean, certainly that, that is a risk, right? So is, is sort of the tail risk of kind of, you know, high inflation higher than it was uh, several months ago? Yeah, for sure. But, you know, we do see, you know, quite a lot of slack in the economy. You have to remember uh, that nearly half of the jobs that you were lost have still yet been recovered. Um, you know, the small businesses are suffering. So, you know, we just view this as, you know, still very much a relief and not necessarily, not necessarily stimulus. And and I think it's really important also to realize that even though there are lots of headlines about uh, potential you know, additional fiscal stimulus. This was the easy part in some ways for the Biden administration. This is likely, um, you know, a kind of the easier part of his fiscal stimulus package. So uh, we don't necessarily expect a lot more stimulus coming online in 2021. That will also, uh, you know, prevent again sort of that inflationary uh, breakout. Libby, we have a viewer writing in with, I think, a pretty good question, and that is, did they really direct this stimulus at an economy that no longer exists? Because it's been recovering. It's not in the same place it was two, three months ago. And is this actually too much at this point, given where we are? For example, on state and local aid, as you know, a lot of states actually are doing as well or better in their tax revenues, and that wasn't expected. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, now, our municipal folks will say that you know many states uh, are still you know very much beleaguered and very much need this. And the way that uh, this was this provision about state and local funding in particular was fashioned is it really does try to direct aid to those states with higher unemployment rates. Uh, so it's not just kind of pro rata across the. The 50 states, it really is uh, you know, targeted uh, more to those states that are 
are in need. Um, and so is, you know, the unemployment insurance. This, of course, was a, a priority for Senator Manchin, you know, in particular, to try to make sure that there's enough incentive for people to go back to work uh, and not necessarily to stay on unemployment. So, look, I mean, the proof will be in the pudding. This is certainly an enormous bill. Um, but, you know, we think in many ways this is, this is needed and, again, will certainly contribute to growth uh, and recovery, but doesn't necessarily look like it's inflationary at this point. So, Libby, you mentioned Senator Manchin, and one of the issues surrounding him was actually the minimum wage, which he was not in favor of taking up to 15. That's not in the stimulus bill. Didn't make it. But I heard him over the weekend say 100 senators, he said, favor raising the minimum wage to some level. He's in favor of $11. He thinks 15 is too much. Is he right about that? Is it inevitable we're going to raise the federal minimum wage to some degree? I think there is a lot of support uh, in, in the Senate. We'll see. I don't know about 100 senators, but certainly – could you get you know 60 senators on board with a federal minimum wage increase? You know for sure that $15 just seemed like a bridge too far for obviously for you know, to get to get those 60. Um, so so we'll see. I mean I think that this will be a push by the the Biden White House. And look, I think that you kind of take a step back. They're able to get a plan that looked very similar to their original plan through a 50-50 Senate. I mean, quite an accomplishment. And again, I think probably harder going from, from here on out, um, but they were able to accomplish a lot. So even though they weren't able to get this $15 minimum wage increase, I think a lot for the Biden administration to feel pretty good about at this point. So, so Libby, you mentioned you think we're going to have pretty robust growth in 2021. We'll see about 2022. At the same time, we may be able to avoid runaway inflation. In what ways will the economy look different coming out of this pandemic than it looked like going into it? I mean, for example, the scarring. You talked about some of the jobs that are lost. Not clear to me that all those jobs will be coming back. No, no, absolutely. And this is, I think, the big question mark uh, for our U.S. economist team uh, is really, you know, the the degree of scarring, the depth of scarring, and you know, we don't we, we don't really know that yet. Again, you know, almost 50 percent of those jobs that are lost have not yet been recovered. Um, so we'll we'll just have to we'll just have to see. I think the way we work will likely change. Um, I think this has been a proof point that you know, remote working uh, may not be the panacea. But certainly, you know, probably works better than a lot of people a lot of people thought. So I think we can envision probably a more flexible economy. Um, I think the Fed would like to see a more inclusive economy. Powell has said that quite a lot, as as well as uh, Governor Brainerd. Uh, and some of this sort of work from home and remote technology probably uh, will you know enable that uh, further. Okay, thank you so very much. Always great to have Libby Cantrell with us. She's from PIMCO. I want to t tune into Wall Street Week this coming Friday at 6 p.m. New York time. We're going to have a special edition, and we will devote the entire Wall Street Week just to the stimulus question and President Biden's package. It's time now for a check on the markets, and we turn to Abigail Doolittle. Uh, so, uh, Abigail, uh, this is quite an extraordinary day. If you go back to the pre-market, what happened? We were down. When I got up this morning, we were down. Now we come back up. A huge reversal, David. It's really a wild day, to your point. Fickle even, and at this point, mixed, if you can believe it, bigly, uh, widely mixed, I should say. We have the S&P 500 uh, solidly higher. We have the Dow up more than 1%. The S&P 500 equal weighted index. It's up more than 1%. That accounts, uh, makes each member equal weighted. So it's really a, uh, doesn't put as much em emphasis on the Apples and the Microsofts. In the meantime, you have the NASDAQ 100 and the New York FANG index down sharply. So this is all about big tech selling off, that momentum trade selling off as the other sectors, the reflationary sectors, such as the financials, the materials, the industrials are doing much better. This has everything, of course, David, to do with rates. That's the big story over the last few weeks. The 10-year yield back above 1.6% right now. Earlier in the pre-market, that had really had all stocks, all these indexes down sharply. But now it's just pressuring big tech because, of course, it brings into question valuation. On the other hand, it's really helping out the banks. You have the KBW Bank Index at a new all-time high. It's interesting, this market action, David. Yeah, that steep yield curve. The banks really like that in general, I think it's fair to say. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. Coming up, the Chinese hack into tens of thousands of Microsoft accounts. Teresa Payton of Fortless Solutions on the state of U.S. cybersecurity. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention today issued new, long-awaited guidance for what fully vaccinated people can safely do. The agency says those inoculated can visit indoors without masks, but must still wear them in public and avoid large gatherings when around those who aren't immunized or are at high risk for contracting COVID-19. Here in New York, the highest ranking state lawmakers are calling on Governor Andrew Cuomo to step down. He says there's no way he'll resign. Five women have now accused Governor Cuomo of inappropriate conduct. He and his administration also face federal investigations into whether he covered up coronavirus deaths in nursing homes. New York City is preparing to reopen high schools for in-person learning starting March 22nd, returning students in the nation's largest public school system back into the classrooms one year after the pandemic forced to shut down. High schools will be the last school buildings to open in the city. Elementary schools reopened for in-person learning last fall and middle schools opened last month. In China, exports surged the first two months of the year. That reflected strong global demand for manufactured goods. The figures were partly skewed by a low base last year when the economy was in lockdown. Exports jumped almost 61 percent in dollar terms. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much, Mark. Microsoft says that a Chinese government-backed group has hacked into its business email software with reports that it may have affected as many as 60,000 or even more accounts all around the world. To put this latest cyber threat in perspective, we welcome now Teresa Payton, CEO of Fortalis. Ms. Payton served as the chief information officer for the White House under President George W. Bush. Welcome back. Great to have you, Teresa. So we've talked before. We talked about it when it was solar winds, and apparently it was the Russians. Now it's the Chinese with Microsoft. Put this into perspective. How big do we think this is? How bad is it? This is potentially uh, very damaging. Uh, there's estimates that it could be as high as 60,000 victims globally. Uh, but first of all, I just want to applaud Microsoft for the quick disclosure and being very transparent about what happened, what the fixes are. And they have been offering uh, different types of consulting services and advice uh, to any of the potential victims and uh, have set up a call center. They, they've really done a good job responding to this terrible situation. So with solar winds, one of the questions is how long has it been going on? And the more we found out, the longer it's been going on. Do we have any sense with Microsoft how long this might have happened? Yeah, the, the forensics are still ongoing. And as you and I both know, David, um, the first estimates typically are not the final story, and they usually don't get better. We don't typically hear, oh, <laughs> you know, it's going to be six victims, not 60,000, or it took less, they were involved less. Um, so unfortunately, the news typically gets worse as forensics is ongoing. Um, but I do want to give everybody a sense that there is hope. There are some potential fixes for this issue. The first thing is, don't wait to find out whether or not you're a victim. Actually do what's called proactive threat hunting. Look for indicators of compromise. Those have been published by Microsoft the FBI through their InfraGuard program and through Department of Homeland Security CISA division. So go to those proactively and start to look for threats of compromise. Um, the second thing is if you do believe you are a victim, you need to start looking at your email traffic and your email logs to see what type of sensitive and confidential data could have been compromised. But another thing, don't forget, even if you are not directly a victim, chances are somebody in your ecosystem and your third party vendor supplier chain may be a victim, which means your side of communications with them could have been compromised. What about the White House? You served in the White House under George W. Bush, as I say. The Biden White House came out and said companies take this very seriously because so clearly they're they're putting a spotlight on it. Is there anything that the White House can or should do? Where the White House can really assist is, one, um, working with the Hill on any pending legislation uh, for different types of cybersecurity measures encouraging companies to spend money on cybersecurity. Uh, candidly, there should be research and development tax credits given to every organization who invests in cybersecurity because every dollar you spend on security is a dollar you don't get to spend on the business or keep profits in the company. 
Uh, and then one of the biggest things I believe this administration could do is really get into place with our allies, international treaties and accords around sort of the rules of engagement around this basic economic espionage that's happening against private sector organizations and come up with the right standards, the protocols, and really kind of put some teeth behind it. What should happen to nation states when it's found that cyber criminals are operating on what looks like on their behalf? Uh, Teresa, the tech industry in this country is known for innovation. There's been an awful lot of innovation done over the last 20 years. Uh, is there a way to innovate? How fast is cybersecurity really evolving here? Cybersecurity has made leaps and bounds just in the time frame that I've been in it, but there's still a few things missing. Um, for starters, we still put an incredible burden on the user. Uh, don't click on links and open attachments, even though that's typically a user's job uh, to get their job done. They have to click on a links and open attachments. And oftentimes, that is the tactic that cyber criminals and nation state operatives use to get into organizations. So we still have a long way to go even though we've covered a lot of ground in a very short period of time, the state of cybersecurity um, is still incredibly challenged and there's fragility because we don't design for the human. We ask the human to accommodate security designs. And as that continues to change, I have a lot of hope for 2021 and 2022 with the advent of truly using behavioral-based analytics and artificial intelligence to put those safety nets around the users. Um, we will make greater strides in the 12 to 24 months to come. What do you think about employers that actually specifically put out uh, things that could be uh, uh, dangerous and see whether their employees pick up on them? Because I've known some companies, might even include Bloomberg, where if you get caught, you have to go through a training session. Proactive social engineering is really a great best practice and one of many things that should be in any organization's arsenal. But it does help until we do a better job in cybersecurity of truly designing for the human using the technology. Until we get to that point, that proactive social engineering is so valuable and important. And candidly, it doesn't just help your employee at work. It actually helps them in their personal life. I wonder, Teresa, if we're only as strong as our weakest link when it comes to cybersecurity. By that, I mean, it's one thing for a large company like a Bloomberg to be able to pr provide for social cybersecurity. They have a lot of resources they could put after it. But we've got a lot of small businesses and medium-sized businesses across the country that don't have that many resources, and yet they're connected in in various ways to some of the very big systems. You're right, and it's really challenging for small to medium-sized businesses because uh, you know, they're buying expensive technology platforms and hardware, and they just assume security should be built in. And candidly, why isn't it? And so that's one of the things where they're sort of left to fend for themselves. Uh, what I would encourage every small to medium sized business to do is take full advantage of FBI InfraGuard, DHS CISA. If you're in other countries, go to your government organizations. Uh, in other countries, and there are free resources. Oftentimes there's free tools, free uh, employee education awareness kits, and different types of training that you can take advantage of. And as a taxpayer, you've already paid for it. So uh, fully take advantage of those programs. Those will really get you a long way. And finally, Teresa, are companies competing on cybersecurity? I mean, as a consumer, I don't see much of it. There's a little bit with Apple actually criticizing some other uh, computer companies, as you know. But at, at a commercial level, are they competing and say, you should come with us because we have better cybersecurity? I, I think you bring up a great question. And I have seen that where uh, companies uh, basically say our security is better or our privacy policies are better. And I think that's a step in the right direction to be thinking about how to always raise the bar on what a company does to ensure privacy, security, and confidentiality. But I would challenge big tech and social media to say security of each and every one of us should be about the greater good and not something that you consider competitive advantage. And I take a page out of the book from the financial services industry where I worked. We made very clear decisions as an industry that mm. busting fraud rings and busting cyber criminal syndicates right. was in the best interest of the greater good and not something to be sort of um, you hold on to the data yeah. because it's competitive advantage. And so I challenge big tech 
to take a page out of the financial services right. book and do the same. For the greater good. Thank you so much. Always great to have you with us. That's Teresa Payton. She's CEO of Fortalis. Coming up later in this hour, we're going to talk with Anya Manuel of Rice, Hadley, Gates and Manuel about what the hack means for President Biden's restart of his relationship with China. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and the CDC is loosening some rules for those who have been vaccinated. Dr. Rochelle Walensky, CDC director, spoke uh, just a little over an hour ago right now at a briefing. Fully vaccinated people can visit with other fully vaccinated people in small gatherings indoors without wearing masks or physical distancing. Remember here we are talking about private settings where everyone is vaccinated. Still, the CDC is encouraging those vaccinated to keep wearing masks outside when they're with the public and cautions against travel. For more, let's bring in now Bloomberg's Cynthia Coons. She's senior reporter in global business. So, Cynthia, thanks for being with us. Why are they doing this? Thanks for having me. Look, I tend to think this is some good PR for the vaccine. I think they're developing and seeing more and more studies coming out, um, some from other countries like Israel, where we're starting to learn more about how the vaccine works and sort of preventing transmission. That's the big thing is, the, is that does the vaccine stop transmission? And while we don't totally know the answer to that yet, I think news like this is really good PR for the vaccine, and it may help bring some of the people who are hesitant on board with the idea of vaccinating. And that's really the most important part of this right now. So clarify one thing for me, Cynthia, because when I first heard it, it was if you're with other people who've been vaccinated, then you can take your masks off and be with them indoors. Now I hear actually, if you're with some people who really are not high risk at all, like for example, children or grandchildren, that you can similarly take your masks off. Is that right? Yeah, so basically what it is, is if you're with other vaccinated people, you can take your masks off, but if you're with other, unvaccinated people from one household, uh -huh. you can take your masks off. So the, the key there being is it's not to say, okay, now you can have a wedding with 50 people from different households, but rather to say, okay, grandma can come over and your unvaccinated adult and grandchild can spend time with that grandparent if they've been vaccinated without masks. So it's very specific yeah. that they're keeping it to one house, small households yeah. because in essence, the contact tracing yeah. is still critical yeah. and the idea that we know who's mixing with who is still critical. So they're not opening yeah. the floodgates completely right. here. Yeah, but I'll tell you, there's a lot of grandparents out there. That's gonna be a pretty powerful incentive for it. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Cynthia Coons. Still ahead, we're gonna talk with David Cordani. He is Cigna CEO. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. President Biden will formally create a gender policy council within the White House. As part of two executive orders he intends to sign today to mark International Women's Day. He'll also ask the Education Department to re-examine the Trump administration's policies and rulemaking on Title IX. That's the law which governs the way sex-based discrimination in schools is handled. The World Bank says that there are still 38 countries where women can be fired from their jobs for becoming pregnant. World Bank chief economist Carmen Reinhart spoke on Bloomberg TV on International Women's Day. She said the pandemic has made, made it even harder for women to escape poverty. Pope Francis today wrapped up the first ever papal visit to Iraq, which came amid concerns as the tour often featured maskless crowds in packed churches. Francis said he weighed the risks of a high-profile trip to Iraq during the coronavirus pandemic, but said he decided to go ahead with it after, which, after much prayer and believed that God would look out for the Iraqis who might get exposed. Saudi Arabia says part of its oil infrastructure came under missile and drone attack yesterday in an escalation of regional hostilities with Iran backed by Houthi rebels. The provocation briefly sent crude oil prices soaring above $70 a barrel for the first time in more than a year before retreating slightly. The attacks... Uh, 
cover intercepted were, but were likely complicate efforts by President Biden to engage in nuclear diplomacy with Iran. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. As Mark just reported, a key Saudi Arabian oil site was attacked by rebels in Yemen. And yet another missile strike in a region that is very troubled, and oil prices are up on the news. To put it all in perspective, we welcome now Bloomberg anchor of Commodities Edge, as well as Bloomberg Markets and the European Close, Alex Steele. And if that's not enough, it also does cable. She came away to do that. Thank you so much, Alex, because you're the expert on oil. How shook up should we be? Um not quite. I mean, the port area does handle about 95% of Saudi Arabian exports, so it's quite a big deal, but no production was actually harmed, and only one part uh, of the port was injured. There's a few takeaways. Um, one is the market reaction quite different than when we saw in the previous uh, strike that did interrupt oil production. And the other is how this dynamic plays out between the U.S., Saudi Arabia and Iran. As the U.S. appears to still want to bring Iran to the table in terms of a nuclear deal, some analysts say that part of the conversation just got a lot longer and a lot tougher. Well, there have been various missile strikes over there, as you know, involving rebel bases in Syria and, and also in Iraq. So uh, how realistic do you think it is that we'd get Iran back to the bargaining table? Because ultimately, that does affect how much oil gets produced, right? Absolutely. Um, there are indications that they're selling it sort of on back channels anyway. So the oil, some oil is coming out of Iran. This, you know, packaged maybe a little bit differently. Um, but in terms of new production coming online, that's definitely a good question. In the summer, we get elections uh, in Iran. So that also raises concerns of if a deal is done, doesn't it have to happen before elections where more hardliners uh, could potentially come into power? Now, where Saudi Arabia comes into play is President Trump and Saudi Arabia uh, really blossomed in their relationship. And the President Biden administration has taken a much harder line when it comes to Saudi Arabia, for example, with the Khashoggi uh, murder as well as with arms sales. Uh, so how do they wind up aligning themselves if they do want to bring Iran back to the table? And who has the leverage? It's always the conversation uh, when it comes to Iran. Such a great point. But I wonder whether this could be bad news being good news in the sense that insofar as President Biden was distant distancing himself a little bit, yeah. particularly from the Crown Prince. They see that attack and the U.S. may say, you know what, we, get, we can't go away quite, quite yet. You still got problems with those Houthi rebels down there from Yemen. Yes, and I think it does make that conversation, that harder line conversation, um, a bit more difficult. Um, also, if there is some supply disruption, you know, the world still needs OPEC to be the spare capacity supplier. Like, yeah. you still need Saudi Arabian oil uh, to pump more, particularly if U.S. companies are much more pumping averse and they're going under capital discipline. The real spare capacity that is Saudi Arabia. So that, I would think, also complicates um, the issue, whereas President Trump made no bones about trying to influence OPEC and Saudi Arabian policy. Clearly, President Biden is going to do something a little bit different, but then that has to be in the mix there as well. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming over from cable to do you this. Bet. This is Alex Steele, anchor of just about every program here. Oh, that's Bloomberg. so not true. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, more important, be sure to tune into Alex's interview tomorrow with Mike Worth. He's the Chevron CEO. That's going to be coming up at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time here in New York. This is Balance of Power, and we are on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The National People's Congress continues in Beijing with relatively modest projections coming out on the GDP growth for this year and relatively little said, explicitly at least, about relations between the second largest economy in the world and the United States. Welcome now Tom Orlick. He's chief economist for Bloomberg Economics. So, Tom, have you been surprised by anything thus far? And particularly, they were a little lowballing, it feel like, on the GDP growth. It was a bit lowballing on the GDP target, David, a 6% target for the year. We think they're going to comfortably vault over that. Um, coming off the low base in the COVID year, we think that GDP growth for 2021 will be above 8%. Um, so the negative, in a sense, is that they've stuck with any type of target at all. Most people think that targeting GDP growth is a big source of distortions in the Chinese economy, and this was an opportunity, a missed opportunity, to get rid of that old-school approach. The positive 
is that by setting a more modest 6% goal when the expectation is that growth will be much stronger than that, at least for 2021, we won't have the target introduce, introducing those distortions. We won't have officials having to dash for growth at any cost. And, and Tom, what did you glean, if anything, from what they've said about U.S.-China relations? So um, I think that the Chinese are uh, in a watching and waiting moment. The last four years uh, were pretty traumatic for Beijing-Washington, D.C. relations. Uh, we had the trade war, the technology sanctions, the stresses that came from the COVID crisis. Now the Biden team have come back in. The diplomatic guardrails have come back on, but we've not really heard a lot of substance from the Biden side on what they actually want to do. So the Chinese have re-emphasized their red lines, their red lines around Taiwan, notably. Um, but in terms of the substance of how they want to organize the relationship, I think they're still waiting to see what we hear from the Biden team. OK, Tom, really great to have you with us. Thank you so much to Tom Orlick of Bloomberg Economics. The Biden administration has a range of tricky issues to address as it formulates its policy toward China. To take us through those related to national security and technology, welcome now Anya Manuel. She's founding partner of Rice, Hadley, Gates & Manuel, a strategic consulting firm that helps U.S. companies navigate international markets. She formerly served at the State Department under President George W. Bush. So, Anya, thank you so much for being with us. You heard what Tom just had to say. There have been reports out of Bloomberg, actually, that as Biden comes in and looks at China relations, he's going to focus on tech, particularly particularly technology. Where are we with respect to our relationship with China when it comes to technology? Thank you for having me, David. It, you're right that the tech competition with China is really where this issue is joined. And the Trump administration did a lot to, I would say, shore up our defenses, tougher export controls, uh, more restrictions on Chinese investments in the U.S. And I think what you're going to see out of the Biden administration is an effort to have a positive offensive strategy. What can we do to ensure that we remain the innovation superpower? I don't know if you saw out of the two sessions in China, there was a big um, announcement that the Chinese are going to spend 10 percent more on R&D in certain key tech areas, and then 7% more for the next five years after that. Uh, that's got to be getting people thinking in Washington, D.C. They've done a lot, the Biden administration has, to try to get tech talent into the administration uh, with the Office of Science and Technology Policy and others. So um, I'm hoping for good things. So, so I, you wrote a fascinating piece for Foreign Affairs, actually, uh, it, recently, in which you talked about the model, which is, I think, civilian-military fusion in China. Do they have a fundamentally different model on how they approach technology and the competition rivalry in technology from the way we do it? Yeah, I did. Thank you for asking. Yes, they do have a different model. I wrote that piece with Kath Hicks, who, of course, is now the number two over at the Pentagon. Um, yes, Chinese civ mill fusion is very different from how the West would do it. In essence, private sector companies in China are required to cooperate with the People's Liberation Army. There are several research institutes that deal specifically with the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. And so there's this whole of government approach to getting the best tech available to the Chinese military. Now, some parts of that are copying what the U.S. did <laughs> decades ago. You know, we have DARPA, great research institute. More recently, we've come up with the Defense Innovation Unit out here in Silicon Valley. But of course, ours is all based on private enterprise and, and private innovation. And it's not as top down as it would be in China. So it, it sort of mixes in the civilian with the military a bit. And, and let me bring that forward to the Microsoft hack that we just learned about, where Microsoft said that there's a hack of uh, business email accounts, and there are accounts that could be 60,000 accounts or something around the world. How does that fit into the Chinese strategy? Because Microsoft says it was a state-sponsored group behind it. Yeah, I read that as well. Um, it's always really hard to attribute where things are coming from. Microsoft has some of the best cyber defenses out there. Amazing that they were hacked, which means we're all vulnerable. It just reiterates again that each of us individually have to be vigilant with respect to cybersecurity. There is a constant low level of conflict here, whether it's the Russians, the Chinese, and some 
um, in some cases, the Iranians and the North Koreans. This is just going to continue to happen. And a lot of it happens out of our view. You know, you saw the U.S. government say, we're going to respond to the Russia hack, you know, in a time and place of our choosing. There's probably a lot going on behind the scenes that's covert that we don't know about. Uh, so I'd just like to ask you specifically about that, Anya, because I said you've served in an administration. You know what it's like in the executive branch. To put it crassly, do we have our act together? And by that, I mean, do we have clear lines of authority? Are we sharing information? Do we have somebody clearly responsible for cybersecurity for us? On cyber, we do. We now have a deputy national security advisor for cyber. She has a great reputation. Um, I would say I would give us a B to B plus on having our act together. And I think actually the folks within the administration would agree this is really hard to do well. You know, the Pentagon stood up Cyber Command several years ago, now almost a decade ago, I think. Um, I know there's a lot of good stuff happening there. This is incredibly hard to do. How much do you cooperate with the private sector? How much does the government do by itself? Is the government responsible for just protecting .gov and .mil domains, or do they have to also protect what's going on within U.S. commerce? Obviously, that's not possible because it's so big. So this is a really thorny issue, and boy, we're working hard on it, but we're not all the way there. So, Anya, that leads me necessarily to the question about working with our allies, because President Biden in coming to office says he really wants to do things multilaterally. When it comes to cybersecurity, given that it's that hard for us to do it ourselves, is there any realistic hope that we can work with allies to make real progress, particularly with respect to China? Yeah, there is. I mean, there's, as I know, there's already a lot of information sharing between the five eyes intelligence services, so our closest allies in the UK, Australia, elsewhere. Um, so I know that a lot of that happens. You could probably imagine doing even more information sharing with private sector companies that would go through the individual governments. But um, a lot of that is well in train. What I think we need to move on now, and you've heard the Biden administration say some positive things about it, is mm -hmm. as we get our innovation ecosystem up and running to make sure mm -hmm. that we, the U.S., the West, right. <laughs> remains front and center on right. artificial intelligence, quantum right. computing, semiconductors, all of these key pieces. Right. Um, we need to do more there. And you hear the Biden administration yep. saying it, but I think they haven't quite defined how they want to do it. Sounds like there's a lot of work to be done. Thank you so much, Anya. Always great to have you with us. That's Anya Manuel. She's former State Department official and founding partner of Rice, Hadley, Gates, and Manuel. Coming up, David Cordani. He is CEO of Cigna. He's going to be here to discuss what the pandemic has meant for his company and what comes next for him. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The pandemic and the government response to that pandemic has changed the face of healthcare, and Cigna has been right at the center of a lot of those changes. We welcome now the CEO of Cigna. He is Mr. David Cordani. So, welcome. It's great to have you back with us, David. Uh, give us a sense. The pandemic's changed all of our lives. How has it changed your business? Um, significantly on some levels, not at all on another level. So, uh, we're fortunate to serve 175 million customer relationships around the world. So the pandemic changed the way people interact, uh, changed the way people work, et cetera. So meaningful changes there. On another level, since our business is around helping individuals around their health, well-being, and peace of mind, it actually just reinforces the importance of what we do. So let me give you a concrete example. Working with clients, be they um, individual corporate employers or health plans, we've worked to return even more affordability savings to them in 2020 because of the pandemic, supporting their businesses, working with our customers or patients. We work to offset economic challenges with expanded coverage above and beyond what the coverage programs were and with healthcare providers that were um, disjointed because of lack of access of their services, providing financial support. So in some ways it changed everything and in other ways it just reinforced the imperative of what we do, trying to help people from a health, well-being and peace of mind standpoint. Tell us about that affordability component because that's been something that has been frankly lacking in a lot of our healthcare for a long time. It's been growing faster than inflation. How are we doing that? How much of that is technology and specifically telemedicine because you just made the investment in MD Live. Yeah. Yeah, David. So affordability we see as the number one need around the globe. 
so improving value or affordability from an individual standpoint. We were the first in our space three years ago to step forward and say we we're going to reduce the rate of cost growth to a CPI level, consumer price index level, indicative of other cost increases. And when we made that declaration three years ago, a lot of people thought it was impossible, yet we are approaching that threshold now with a majority of our larger clients already experiencing rates of cost growth at that level. We stepped forward today at our investor day and said, we're gonna to seek to reduce the rate of cost growth to zero or even a negative or a reduction of total cost for our most advanced clients and their, um, their customers um, by 2024 from that standpoint. Telemedicine or alternative sites of care is a meaningful contributor. It pre presents the opportunity to have more active engagement, which means you could close gaps in care or improve clinical quality. Take a chronic individual helping to ensure that compliance with medication and testing regimens. Two, by bringing care more efficiently to the individual, the site of care, lack of physical access and more virtual access creates a financial savings from that standpoint. And then lastly, point three with virtual care through MD Live, an acquisition we just announced, it'll present an opportunity to have individuals who have multiple chronic conditions be coordinated in a more orderly way with their practicing physician. So it's a complementary aspect of it. So affordability is mission critical. We're on the forefront in terms of setting very aggressive goals that are customer friendly in terms of the rate of growth. And we're seeking to reduce that rate of growth even further down to zero for our most sophisticated clients by 2000, end of 2023. And virtual is a big part of that equation. Uh, David, talk about innovation. I mean, a lot of us have been stunned by the development of these vaccines. I mean, we had experts on a year ago who said it can't be done. It's never been done that fast. It happened, in fact. Does that have ramifications beyond this pandemic and beyond COVID-19? It absolutely does. So, uh, and, and David, I really appreciate the way you articulate it because oftentimes it's when societies are confronted with the never statements that the best innovation transpires. So the notion of we can't develop a vaccine that quickly, you tap into the ingenuity of public-private partnership and allow the creativity and the innovation to transpire and look at the power of that. We have multiple vaccines in less than a one year time frame, and that they were not only developed in a shorter time frame, but in a more cost efficient fashion and they present modalities that can be delivered around the world. So now question two comes, how do we learn from that as a society and actually have pharmaceutical, in this case, innovation, track more like that as a normal course of business mm -hmm. because you could go on a faster cycle, but also cheaper cost to delivering the overall innovation from that standpoint. And then the second point I would make relative to innovation is oftentimes innovation is accelerated either in terms of speed or quality through partnership. And as a corporation, we say we seek to be the undisputed partner of choice. And there are multiple examples where we partner with organizations that many see as competitors. We see them as partners because if we could create mutual value or we could accelerate innovation or we could expand the addressable market, that's a net positive from a societal standpoint. And so I think there's a lot of bright spots in that vaccine process. As you know so well, we have a $1.9 trillion, give or take, uh, a stimulus bill that looks like the president's going to get to sign later this week. Some of that has to do, as I understand, with affordability of insurance, health insurance and provision of health care costs. How will it change your business as you've looked at this? I, mean, I don't see it changing the business. I think it's in support of some of the customer groups who are in need. And I'll give you two examples. One is within that bill, um, which, as you said, most likely will soon be law this week, there is further financial support for what you may know as the individual public exchange or the so-called Obamacare exchange to extend the financial subsidies, so in incre increasing affordability or expanding the number of individuals that are eligible for subsidy through that standpoint. Secondly, we know that in the United States, there is still some disjoint relative to the uh, U.S. commercial employment marketplace, meaning people are out of work. And typically when you're out of work, you go on to or you have COBRA available to you. COBRA does not have an employer subsidy that's built into it. This bill will bring a larger subsidy temporarily in to provide a, we'll call it a temporary safer landing zone. In both cases, it improves affordability to individuals either through the individual exchange or through COBRA because of dislocation at a point in time. That's a net positive from a societal standpoint. We serve individuals, so we'll have more individuals to serve as a result of it. But I think you come back to the, um, the individual consumer basis. It's a net positive because it's more accessible and more affordable. 
And finally, a question that will have to be short on, but it takes a lot more time, but it's important to you and it's important to me, and that is the relationship between physical health and mental health. We've seen a lot of stress, not just on physical health, but mental health during this pandemic. What have you learned? Well, what we've learned even before the pandemic set in was that um, physical and mental health, the ability to look at those together to treat the whole person, presents a phenomenal opportunity to improve quality and peace of mind for the individual. And back to your prior point, David, it improves affordability. Coming into the pandemic, before that, we feel that the largest, most dynamic study of its kind around loneliness, and then we augmented it with a study around resilience. And what it told us is that even as we stepped into the pandemic, loneliness, a type of mental health challenge, and resilience, the ability to manage that, were either increasing in loneliness or decelerating relative to resilience. So that had us create more awareness, had us work in different partnerships, and has us expanding services. For example, we'll end with the MD Live example. Right. Having behavioral health and mental well-being services that are available real time, yep. virtually to individuals, right. we're seeing a massive explosion right. of the use of those services with right. very positive outcomes. And I know Cigna was really ahead of the game on that. Thank you so much to David Cordani. He is Cigna CEO. Coming up, we're gonna have a second hour of Balance of Power on Bloomberg Radio. This is, after all, Bloomberg.